manager and a specialist in many other areas in terms of the internet and technologies. Uh, the organization focuses mainly on priority of human rights and democracy, and they do that through the media. I hand over to Noma Shadu. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this session um, because I was telling um, Pfizer earlier on that we've been speaking about disinformation in various aspects, but never really looking at it from a point of how does this intersect with other online harms? Because reality is when we do speak about hate speech, when we do speak about incitement to violence, there's always an element of disinformation within that. But I'd like to start to highlight that the reality is the internet on its own, when it came about, when it was created, I mean, that was a space that was envisioned for us to be able to practice, you know, our freedom of expression, for us to be able to hold power to account, and for us to obviously be able to express ourselves, to link with global connections, etc. However, the very same space has become now kind of a, a, a bigger platform for those that really want to use the, the space for counter narratives or for obviously online harms to push a certain agenda, and that is the reality. The danger of this comes about when we now see it affecting our elections, affecting decision makings, because all of us sitting here have a right to make an informed decision. So for one person to be able to go online, interact with content that stimulates a certain decision, that's where the threat is starting to become. So what I'll be doing now is I'll be going through, um, as I was saying, um, painting the picture of the intersection focusing on a few case studies, focusing on a few solutions, and then obviously my colleague Tina here will come in from a more legal um, case study perspective, and also speaking a bit on gender as well, because at the end of the day, that has become one of the biggest threats that we're also fighting online, right? Uh, Media Monitoring Africa, we used to be project, um, but for quite a number of years now, we are actually Media Monitoring Africa, and we've been monitoring media coverage since 1993, and in doing so, we've been able to kind of see the trends over the years, the coverage over the years, and how that has been coming about. But in the year 2017, we started realizing there's actually something happening here that really poses, as I said, a huge threat. We started seeing that there's a lot of narratives that are going online that are interacting with the same credible information that everyone has the right to. Right? And we started thinking, as sitting as citizens, how can we empower? Because at the end of the day, reality is we can speak to government, we can speak to big tech. But if somebody had to, I always say this example, if somebody had to post uh, one tweet speaking of a counter narrative and they're trying to push a certain false agenda and no one retweeted it, would it actually have the impact that it's supposed to have? No. Because what they're looking for is for amplification. Right? They're looking for you to reshare and for them to connect to your followers and the next followers, etc. And we saw that if we do not empower citizens and if we do not um, give them the literacy that they need, then we're, at the end of the day, as much as we can make the noise, we're not dealing with what we need to deal. And that's when um, a platform called Real 4 on 1 came about. So this is an online platform that allows a citizen to be able to submit a complaint that they see online of any digital offense between the following, harassment, disinformation, um, incitement to violence, and as well as, um, I think I'm forgetting one, hate speech, thank you. And the idea behind this is number one, we were speaking about this earlier on as well, there's a fine line when it comes to freedom of expression and censorship. And that's the line that we need to protect. But at the same time, we need to protect the spaces that we're interacting with. So this is empowering a citizen to say, if I'm seeing something online and I'm suspecting that there might be an element of disinformation, let me submit this. Now what happens behind the show is that we have tech, media, and law experts who review it. Right? Reviewing meaning they do the research, etc. From there on it goes to a secretariat. Now we work with various organizations, various bodies, even our government and tech itself. The whole of this as well is to emphasize on the strength of a multi-stakeholder approach. We cannot be speaking about tech without actually involving tech. We cannot be speaking about government without even involving them as well. And that's why the system was important for us to actually initiate. In 2019, it was launched and we actually held our election then and we started seeing actually the impact of this because remember now it was a pilot stage almost 
And that year, the amount of information that was going online that could have held so many people from going out to vote, from as small as if you've got um, artificial nails like mine, you're not allowed to go and vote. Because obviously in South Africa, for example, when you, after you vote, there's a mark that they leave on your thumb. Now, the assumption was, if you, do not, if you have these type of nails, you won't be allowed to vote because it means that they cannot put the mark. Imagine how much uh, interaction that content actually had. But because we had such a system, we were able to pick it up, to speak to relevant bodies, and to try and stop it. And obviously, our electoral body was our biggest partner in this, which is the IEC in South African terms. I'm highlighting this platform because it's the platform that helped us to analyze trends, to analyze how the involvement of um, disinformation online. And what was scary for us to realize in the past years was that it's getting more sophisticated. It's morphing. It's becoming very difficult for somebody to actually differentiate from credible information to false information. To a point where as technology is getting advanced, disinformation is also getting advanced. We're talking about deep fakes, right? For those that do not know what deep fakes are, these are altered images and audio um, um, uh, media um, uh, assets that are put together to create a false narrative. So I'm speaking here and I'm saying disinformation is a threat to our democracy. Somebody could have taken a video of me, used my voice and made me say something else completely different, right? There's different qualities to it. Some do it so perfectly that the AI technology is in lip sync. You wouldn't even be able to say. And what happens? Everyone now says that Nom Shato said one, two, three. And now take somebody in power and do something like that and let that go online. And the reality is, I'm saying this from an African perspective and obviously globally, not everyone has the literacy to understand there is such a thing called a deepfake, or there is such a thing called photoshops, or there is such a thing as me taking just the little element of the truth and using it to twist it in my own alternative. And the reality is disinformation always, always, always has a percentage of truth. That's how they thrive. Uh, a little bit of an example as well was in South Africa, there was a day, a night, where all WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook went down. Like it was not connecting all of a sudden. The following morning, well, it was resolved later, but the following morning on our WhatsApp, there was voice notes going around, right? Um, you all saw what was happening yesterday. What they were doing is they were collecting your data, and if you do not share this, you won't be able to use your account because it will be deactivated. And it was shared so many times to a point where people really believe such content. And for me, that honestly highlights the danger that we're dealing with. And if we are not combating it, and if we are not understanding that this is a pattern, right? And I'll give incitement to violence. Um, we had a bit of an unrest whereby um, a video was used to, amplification, uh, I mean, to amplify violence, right? It was a video that was taken in 2016 in India. It was of a burning building. People were jumping out. But this was posted on our Twitter and it was referenced as, um, don't go to this street, guys. The, uh, this is the current situation. That was shared over 300,000 times. It was interacted with not only locally, continentally, and globally, right? But if anyone paused to actually investigate that video, they'd realize a number of elements. Language, monuments, what the people were wearing, right? And even um, the building itself, the street, the signages. You would have been able to pick up this is not in South Africa, none of our official languages, none of our monuments, and obviously, as well, none of our burning buildings. But it was shared and people were amplifying it. Mind you, in the beginning I told you, if no one actually retweeted that, it would have stayed the same, it wouldn't have amplified it. But what that did was the way it incited violence, it did it in such a way that it went from online to offline. And that's where also the danger comes in. Hate speech, same thing, and I think um, Tina will touch on that. Harassment is the same thing, right? You're being harassed online, and mind you, there's different um, online violences that one can experience, from doxing, right, to trolling, to your bots and botnets pushing the same narrative. And people can't tell that if I'm seeing five accounts saying the same thing, this should be a red flag. Literally, they don't even change a word sometimes. But it's different profile pictures, different names. But because people don't understand that it's all about your feed looking the same way for you to perceive what? A decision at the end of the day. So this session is looking at that and is looking at how do we end up looking at the current context and ensuring that we're not talking about the future. We understand and we're moving with the technology, but we are also empowering at the same time. We're also highlighting the danger of it. We're also bringing in democracy because that's what we're holding 
to account. That's what we want to protect at the end of the day, the human right to make that informed decision. And at the end of the day, if all these digital offenses are not spoken about in the same bucket, right? And by in the same bucket, I mean they all hold the same level of impact, then what we're doing is we're almost working in silos. Hence I say, mis and disinformation cannot leave the other offenses. I think my time is up. I'm gonna allow Tina to come up. Thank you so much. Thanks, Norm Shadow. So unsurprisingly, as a lawyer, I'll be talking about the law. And even more unsurprisingly, as a human rights lawyer, I'm gonna take us through a rights-based sort of understanding of this topic. I firstly wanna look at how disinformation manifests, particularly in South Africa, but as I've picked up during this conference, there's a lot of overlap around the world. Secondly, how disinformation intersects with specific rights and what this then means for our legal frameworks. So firstly, we've seen, particularly in South Africa, a lot of gendered disinformation, particularly our journalists. They've been targeted significantly over, over recent months and over recent years. Disinformation is also being increasingly racialized. South Africa has a complex, diverse racial history, and a lot of disinformation is pegged to how we identify racially. We also have a lot of concerns around nationality and ethnicity, and South Africa is quickly becoming one of the most xenophobic countries in the world. And lastly, we are seeing a lot of disinformation around people's types of employment. So if you are a journalist, you are likely to be targeted more. If you are a female politician, you are likely to be targeted more. If you are a human rights activist, you are likely to be targeted more. So these are all of the ways in which we are seeing disinformation manifest. But what I want to focus on and what I think is a very useful example is the gendered element of disinformation. And this feeds quite nicely into a rights-based framework and South Africa's legal framework, which I think can be a useful example for others. So if we look at what gender discrimination means, and we've had a few conversations over the course of the week with Irene Khan, with APC, with others around what we mean by gender discrimination, I mean, not discrimination, gender disinformation. And here we're looking at the intentional spreading of harmful and misleading content that is grounded in misogyny, gender stereotypes, patriarchal beliefs with an aim to silence, exclude, and cause harm. So as Norm Shadow suggested, we're seeing shallow fakes, we're seeing deep fakes, we are seeing harassing content that is false. And this has the effect of causing particularly women and members of the LGBTQI plus community to leave platforms or to be silenced. So their freedom of expression is limited and this in turn limits people's access to information. We are also seeing the ways in which this impact specifically from a rights-based perspective, obviously freedom of expression and access to information, but as well as people's thoughts and beliefs. And this is a right we don't often talk about because it can get complicated and people often associate it with religion, but the way in which disinformation is changing the way we think and changing the way particularly young people are being radicalized is frightening. And from a gendered perspective, when we reinforce gender narratives about women needing to stay at home and make babies and take care of their husbands, we are, teaching children to think that way, and, and that is a huge consequence for our future. We're also seeing significant impacts on the rights to dignity, equality, and non-discrimination. And I think from a gender perspective, that's just abundantly clear. And we're also of great concern seeing a lot of threats to safety, and this can both be physical safety. We've seen in South Africa, there's been a few cases where the details, the personal details of female journalists have been published on, on Twitter by political members, actually members of our parliament, which is concerning, and they've had rape threats and death threats, and sometimes this has resulted in physical offline harm. But there's also a significant harm to people's psychological integrity and their mental health, and all of these feed into the way in which gender discrimination is impacting our rights. So, what now? It's a mess, right? Disinformation is spreading like wildfire, we're struggling to control it, but there are some really exciting and novel ways of, of figuring it out. There's been a lot of talk, this conference, about regulation. Um, some people are, are for it, some are against it, some are still figuring it out. Personally, and speaking on behalf of MMA, as I'm their lawyer, so I'm technically allowed to do so, there's a lot of concerns with regulating disinformation because this can have consequences for, for free speech. We're seeing that in a lot of countries in Africa. So we don't need to regulate. We've got laws and we must use them. We just need to use them strategically. And the irony of this whole situation is because disinformation impacts so many rights, we can use the laws that protect those rights 
to address disinformation. And so the intersection of disinformation, the harms it causes and the rights it violates means that we have existing frameworks that we can rely on. We have a fantastic international law framework that feeds into the way domestic constitutions are developed, which in turn feed into the way that domestic legislation is drafted. And I want to use a South African example to show how we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to come up with new laws. We may need to tweak some laws here and there. We may need to engage with our lawmakers about what online harms are, because some of them are not so aware. But we recently passed the Domestic Violence Amendment Act, and this aligns to the Harassment Act in South Africa as well. And this act can be used to get a protection order in South Africa. So if someone is threatening you, harassing you, stalking you, sending you messages that you don't want, saying things about you that you don't want, you can rely on these two pieces of legislation to get a judge to say, A, take down that content, B, stop sending that content, C, if you do any of this again, you'll be committing a criminal offence and you'll face various sort of criminal penalties. And so we spent a significant amount of time pushing the government to amend the law to recognise online harms as one of the harms that can take place. And recently, in January this year, the president signed this act or signed the amendment. So we've got the existing framework. We didn't need to reinvent it. We needed to add one or two sections to change the way in which we can engage in these issues. We then got another section included, which leads to platform accountability. Now, if you get the order that you need, you can then take that to Meta, to TikTok, to whichever platform the content may have been shared on and say, look, this needs to be taken down. And based on our experience with platforms when we're trying to get content taken down, there's a lot more power when you have a court order. The final really wonderful part about these acts is that they are, are set to be victim and survivor centric. So you don't need a lawyer to represent you. You don't need to file copious amounts of legal pleadings. You can go by yourself with a friend, with someone that you trust and say, this is what's happened to me. The police officer or the magistrate must help you fill out the forms and they will take you through the entire process. So it's meant to be cost effective. It's meant to be timely. And this is just a really practical solution that we can engage with online harms. And finally, bringing this back to sort of disinformation before I tie it up, we can use these acts to address disinformation without restricting speech or without regulating the way in which speech happens. When there is speech that is harmful, when it is harassing, and when it violates our legal provisions, when it is contrary to our international human rights framework, something does need to be done. But we already have existing frameworks that can enable this. And we would love to spend as much time as possible talking to all of you about the Real 411 as a social platform, about the law reform efforts that we've done, about the ways in which we're engaging with community media to, to grapple with these things. All of these require a holistic solution. The law, as much as I love it, and it is one of my favorite things, is not the only solution. And it can only take us so far. We need people to be kind online. And we need to be sensible about the way in which we suggest people should or shouldn't talk and what the long-term consequences of that would be. But I'm incredibly hopeful and incredibly excited, having heard everything that's been said this week, that there are a lot of phenomenal people in the world doing the right thing. And I think we can combat this without causing too much harm or no harm at all, if possible. Thank you, Tina. Um, I think the time was quite tight but I'm sure there's a lot to chew on and to think about. Um, I was actually going to ask Namashado also even to just give a case study. Um, we've had a number of that in South Africa, especially with misinformation, disinformation, and female journalists being targeted uh, on social media where politicians put out their phone number and their personal addresses. And we've seen how mentally it has affected some of them and the consequences of it. But uh, Media Monitoring Africa, because they monitor the media and they do a lot of research, have actually come up with magnificent uh, research and we've been able to get law lawyers such as Out and uh, some others actually volunteering pro bono taking up these cases um, and I think I'll hand it back over to you. Perhaps you want to talk about SABC 8 or any later one or even the Ranjani one that you think about? Um, I think historically I'll really try to be short time. <laughs> Historically, South Africa is coming from a background where freedom of expression was really something that was fought for. And we protect media freedom like it's our last drop of water, because that is a right that no one should take away from any citizen. And hence, media monitoring Africa with the coverage. 
in doing in saying that we have robust media journalists who really go above and beyond to ensure that they're bringing factual information holding power to account and in doing so we have female journalists who are the greatest at their jobs but because they are now putting power to account and maybe they might be somebody's favorite politician or somebody's favorite um, person in power they then form a troll network and what happens is they go online and target that individual or in some cases a person empowered to take their in, the personal information such as their cell phone number and put it on their twitter and tell their followers to say let us go and show uh, the power of our specific party for example meaning what that one journalist is going to be harassed on their own personal line that was meant to be their own and something that they control right and that power was stripped away from her in 2 seconds in other cases is if if a, journal, a female journalist is um perhaps covering a, a story which is quite um I, I well let me say it's 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 a topic of the day or if it's a concern of the day and then under the same post obviously we take pictures this is what's happening now we are outside the court in the very same post the same people that have been following her from that person in power is now saying uh for example um you clown hogging um female why are you even bothering to you know tell us what is true when you yourself are not even close to um the faction of 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 credibility and now they're no longer stripping away way physicality or her, her 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 way of um interacting but they're not even stripping away her credibility because it's now you're known as a journalist who's not able to actually tell credible information because it's a troll network that was formed to obviously uh dislocate her from her job to actually discredit her from her credibility and um I'll touch on that looking at time but it also um brings you back to the realization how if that is taken away from media freedom if now disinformation is sipping into it in that manner in that manner for example what will happen in 10 years time if people can even now go to a credible um you know news site to be able to get information because it's been deemed as a a, a false um news um site i just think that is crucial um and like we say there's much more that we can talk about um uh, can i take a few questions now the lady at the back hi i'm rebecca i'm based in south africa as well um so what would you recommend average citizens do when they recognize you know disinformation online Hello. Okay, it's it's working now. Um good afternoon. My name is Theorus. Um I have a contribution and a quick question. I'll make it very short. Um of course that this topic is very um important for us to discuss. Um as a journalist myself, I had to and of course I've discussed that with Nomshad. I had to move from mainstream journalism into academia because of such harassment. And even within the academic space, um there's a gap in terms of teaching student fact checking and how to identify um deep fake. So really, um we could I mean organizations could be doing more, but if their education is not there, it's still circle back, right? So I I um you see student journal analyst doing practical on i teach um social media in school at student how to do journalism online um and you see them having such challenges you see people poking um things into their messages and trolling them and all they have to do is to just close the account and open another dummy one in another name they don't really know how to report the account they don't even know where to to go so now my question is apart from just um taking pro bono cases and trying to help journalists is there really um much education in and journalism institution to make sure that they really understand the concept of that then secondly is is in terms of education as well do they have adequate training on identified deep fake you could talk to them about it but what are the softwares do they know how to use it do they know how to um differentiate between what deep fake is and just that a video is terrible and they are just using it against the mother thank you um gentlemen and then the lady yeah. <coughs> so hello everyone my name is nicodemus nyakundi from kenya ict action network Uh, I'm good that you realize that most targeted people for disinformation are women 
and actually at Kicktanet, we uh, we had a very hard time with politics. Uh, they just ended Kenyan politics in August. Uh, female politicians were really targeted, and uh, <clears throat> it was so much that most of them avoided the internet because of this information. And you realize that the disinformation is gendered. It is targeted to women, and uh, if you are a woman, you'll be deemed in very way, many ways that your popularity will go down. Uh, my concern is that as we are bringing this conversation on board, what structures or measures are we putting in place to ensure that we peel off the layers of discrimination? We have the intersectionality, whereby are these people, are this disinformation flowing because of gender or because of their career, say, uh, politics, or because of their social class? Uh, as a, uh, currently, I'm holding a position as ICT accessibility and equality for persons with disabilities. And I'll say that one, this information is much or much affects people with disabilities, more so women, more than any other normal person. So many questions. It was so interesting. Thank you. It's so nice to see that we kind of have the same problems, I guess. I'm from Germany, so it's like a really different part of the world. But um, my question would be, did you see that during like the COVID crisis, this whole thing increased because in Germany, people went totally nuts about it. And I mean, you probably own it, know that we have this a bit historical problems with the uh, Nazis and there are so many harassment going on during, co during COVID with journalists and politicians um, and they all tend to say that it's kind of the same thing happening again than during 1934 and before it so it um, yeah that is really so that is really so horrible and yeah that would be interesting and also like a short answer maybe to <laughs> the back I'm working for a reporting platform where like people from like the um, like citizens can just report um, when they see something and I'm a lawyer as well so we try to assess that and then bring it to the public prosecutor's office and yeah it's so horrible what you see online it really is a big shit show sometimes. <laughs> Thank you for those que uh, questions and discussions that we've been having. Before I hand over to the panel, um, I'd just like to uh, touch on your thing. I work for a training institution, um, Institute for Advancement of Journalism in South Africa. And what we've realized is that once journalists, students graduate after their four-year degree, what the university has equipped them with is theory. What is actually missing is the practical implementation. So what we've seen more within South Africa, our editors forum, we've just reworked our journalism curriculum. So what most of the media houses do, they take the journalists, graduates that come into the media houses, and they put them almost through a year's reorientation. So within that year's reorientation, you find organizations like Media Monitoring Africa, the IIJ, and many other organizations that we have in our country, offering different slots, different modules. So they'll talk about misinformation, disinformation. Some will talk about fact-checking, different things. Because what we've realized is that journalists come out, but they're not ready for the newsroom. And because the media landscape is changing so quick and so fast, they no longer have mentors and coaches within the newsrooms. So the NGOs within our environment have realized that's a crucial platform that we need to collaborate far more to equip journalists to ensure that their stories are actual, actually factual. Okay, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll quickly take the first um, two questions and then Tina is going to take the last two questions. Um, the first question speaking on what can you do sitting here? A lot. Actually, the power lies in your hand. Um, this little gadget that we walk around with, in this, you hold so much power because, as I said, uh, as an example earlier on, if no one reshared it, if no one entertained it, if no one commented on it, and if everyone who saw it actually reported it, 
then it wouldn't actually get the amplification it needed. So we always amplify and repeat, report, report, report it. Um, understand also the different platforms and the reporting mechanisms. I think also the lack of education around that in understanding that each platform does have a reporting mechanism. Although yes, there's a lot to work on there as well, but they are there to empower you to be able to do something about anything digital um, in terms of offensive that happens online. Um, you can um, report on harassment, hate speech, etc. Um, hence, real 4 and one we always, always say, please submit any complaints that you see because we want to stop it and halt it. Whether it's a takedown notice, whether it's us pushing around that this is a fake news alert, do not um, believe this, do not share this, do not action it. Because at the end of the day, sometimes it actually goes into cyber security where they want your card details. So they'll come, I use COVID. COVID was the perfect, perfect environment for disinformation. It thrived. Because what happened was people were anxious, people were fearful, so it plays on emotion the most. And because of that environment, it was able to do what it needed to do. And uh, quickly in South Africa, there was a grant that was given to those that were affected by COVID, 350 or something like that. And um, the government rolled it out. Now people are starting to get SMSs. You all heard excitingly, uh, government is now giving out 350 click here um, to be able to actually um, benefit on this. People would click. Now it wants um, your details to get your money. Now it wants, because of the lack of education, understanding that this is not a government site, I need to start looking at this, right? I need to start looking at my link, my HTTP. And it also go goes back to digital literacy. I cannot even begin to emphasize because we cannot already say that just because you have a cell phone, I know everything. No, you don't. You need to continuously learn because at the end of the day, that's what it does. It also gets advanced. So we also need to get advanced. But aside from that, those that don't have access, those that only access it here and there, also don't understand the danger of the devices that they're using. So to them, they're vulnerable. They need the 350. They're going to do anything they need to do to get it. And that's what it wants. Um, so that's, that's just speaking on to your question. And the other one. One of the things that we, we realized as well was that when we are looking at the landscape of disinformation from a perspective of um, digital literacy, the way that AI has come into play has been something that people either see it as something fearful or something that is a threat or either something that is an opportunity, right? However we see it, it itself can also be used in ways that, as, as mentioned, deepfakes. And it was touched on how do you know the difference, right? How do you know lip syncing? Um, and um, if my mouth is not moving with my audio, that means something is completely wrong. But what happens if everything, I wish I had time for a presentation and showed you an example, which I always do, of a, a high president saying something completely out of it, but he looks like he's speaking quite well. It's his voice, everyone, we know how he speaks, it's his mouth moving. But if you saw that half of his side is not moving at all, and it's only like him speaking like this, but it's still the same thing, then you would have been able to pick it up. But if you sitting there and I'm not saying anything about it, how would you know? Right? So there's a huge gap when it comes to education and also goes back to our curriculum. If kids learned about this in school, in terms of a strong digital literacy cu curriculum, sorry, from the youngest of ages, because let's be real, these young ones are so advanced, they're even showing their parents how to do things now, right? And they are the same people who are gonna be using the same platforms in the future. Now, if that young learner, and I think in South Africa, we're starting almost to get there, but in terms of, um, you know, I, I'm not talking coding, etc. so them technologically. Curriculum-wise, there's a lot of things to, that needs to be done. But if that young grade two, well, we've got grades, grade two or grade one learner understood digital literacy from that young age and it moved, with years until they are out to do their degrees and, and university um, qualifications. How much work would you have done? Because you didn't even need to do anything. It was already in the system. It was already in the curriculum. And obviously curriculum changes as well. It changes with time. It changes with context. It changes with um, content as well. Um, so it clearly shows that there's a, lot of, there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of digital literacy and the power that comes with it as well. Thanks. I, what, where are we on time? Um, cool. I'll be very brief. So I think <laughs> your question um, at the back there was, was fantastic and I love the way you describe sort of peeling away the layers of discrimination. And I wish I had the answer. If I did, I think the world would be a, a better place. I think there are a lot of answers and a lot of options, but 
one obvious one is just education and engagement and calling out nonsense. And I know that's hard and I know it's scary, particularly online. And that's one of the ways that you get targeted the most is if you call something out. But those who do feel empowered and those who do feel brave, calling things out can make the world of difference. Uh, we're currently working on a case at the moment around the definition of consent in South Africa's sexual violence laws. And there's been a lot of primarily men who've said some really problematic things about consent. And it's important to call out that content and say, no, this is, that's not what consent is. You are not entitled. And to just be brave enough to say that can, can make a difference and that can empower someone else in turn. So I think there is an onus that rests on all of us as people who care and want the world to be equal and inclusive to take those steps, to hold government account, hold platforms account, hold each other to account. But every little act of discrimination that you see or witness doing something about it can make a significant difference. And then lastly on COVID, yes, it was the worst. We had, so the real 411 platform had just come out of elections and the day we were moving it out of the election space into more broadly online harms was a few days before we went into lockdown. So the platform just went wild and we were moderating content and we were viewing the most awful things. Interestingly, not a lot of it was gender-based. A significant amount was race-based. So black people were blaming white people, white people were blaming black people, different ethnicities and different groups were being blamed for whatever reasons. And then, of course, nationality was a huge one. Um, a lot of Zimbabwean people were blamed for this. A lot of Chinese people were blamed. And it was very much based on these identifying features of people, but not, not so much on gender but it was a huge problem and South Africa's digital literacy is very low. So a lot of harm came from that. A lot of people drank and ate and did really harmful things to their bodies because they read it online and they thought that they should, or their religious leaders or their community leaders were telling them to do it. And trying to rechange those narratives was very, very difficult. Sorry about the time. There's always not enough time. I think one of the crucial things, uh, we've been discussing it briefly this morning too, was uh, at events like this, it's always like-minded people sharing information and talking to each other. What do we do when we go back home? How do we try and go beyond organizations working together, overlapping, complementing what they're doing, to getting the message more down into the ground? I don't know, we were discussing this morning if we should go and start advocating against our Minister of Basic Education, uh, what should we do? But we need to see, see quite seriously, um, I mean we have lots of challenges in South Africa, but advocacy we love doing, collaborating and pressure we like putting on people. So we're actually seriously thinking, again, what do we do to go beyond these forums? How do we make sure that the policies, everything that's in place, actually starts making an impact from the ground up. And that's what I would like to leave with all of us today. Thank you for being here.